Sangha, Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suche doye hula hudi san miao san putoshe. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa. By chen wan jie nan zao yu. Wo jin jen wan de shou chi. Yen jie ru lai zhen shi yi. The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in a hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I bow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture tonight. This is the 1st of June, 2013. We're here. Berkeley, California, we're looking into the Flower Garland Sutra, Ten Grounds chapter, and we're going to get started the way we do by invoking the name of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas here. Um, so, uh, Jason, you're going to have to move all the way down to the end because there's nobody. Otherwise, you'll block off force. There you go. We're glad to see Jason Kung back from India. The last time I saw him was Australia. That was about a month ago. And since then, he's been to all the Buddha's holy places and made it back safely. So, well, I'm glad you made it. You can catch his photos of that journey on various websites. So, we're going to pressure you to put them all in one place so everybody can, if you're on Facebook or not. So, well, yeah. Namo ta fang wang fu hua yen ji hua yen hai wei fu pu sa na ta fang wang fu hua yen ji hua yen hai wei fu pu sa na Ta fang guang fo hua yen ji Hua yen hai hui fo pu sa na Ta fang guang fo hua yen ji Hua yen hai hui fo pu sa na Mo da fang Ho hua yen ji, hua yen hai hui, ho pu sa na mo, ta fang guang fu, hua yen ji, 
Please turn to page 24 and 25 in your text. We are down on the third paragraph, and we'll start with the Chinese over on 24. These are verses, so they probably came with a melody, so we'll chant them instead of just speaking them. Shen Jian Wei Shou Liu Shi Er Shen Jin Wei Shou Liu Shi Er Wo Ji Wo Su Wu Liang Zhong Wo Su Wu Liang Zhong Yun Jie Chu Dang Zhu Chu Zhao Chu Dang Zhu Chu Zhao over to the right, let's do it together in unison. Ready? Here we go. With view of body as the first, the 62 views of self and what belongs to self, of limitless kinds, of skandhas, realms, locations, all attachment to these, Upon the fourth ground, he leaves behind all of this. Okay. Look at the Chinese. Here we go. Shen, body. Jian, view, meaning point of view, perspective. Wei, show, as, head. In other words, first, foremost. So, with the view of the body as primary, as first. Liu, shi, are six ten two sixty two so the Chinese to get to beyond nine right you do multiples so two tens or twenty three tens or thirty like that so Liu Shi six tens or sixty are two body view as first sixty two now this is um, this is verse so you know it's super terse this is condensed to the ultimate point. So 62, you have, that's kind of shorthand, that's code language for 62 views. 62 views are 62 ways of seeing the body. What is it? This is a list. Last week we introduced this section as the, the teaching of lists, like laundry lists, like grocery list, um, name list. The Buddha Dharma comes to us with numbers of lists, numbers of dharmas, so many different kinds. Here we have 62. What's the familiar one? Four Noble Truths, right? We know about the Four Noble Truths. Eightfold Path, we heard of that one. Go a little deeper, some people know about 12 links. Mm, if you heard about the Bodhisattva Path, it's the six perfections, the six paramitas and so forth and so forth. So uh, these are 62 views that the body view comes first. So hold that one, put that one on the table and keep it right there because this is a, this stanza introduces more. What else? Wo ji wo so. Me, wo is actually the Mandarin word for me, I. 
that's the personal pronoun. I wa in Mandarin. Uh, moi in French. Watashi in Japanese. Same. Personal pronouns. First personal pronoun. First person singular. Woman, we. First person plural. So, me, ji, and. Me, and, woso. The stuff that gathers around me. The place where I am. So, self and, often translated, what pertains to the self. But that's, nobody talks like that. What do, you, what do we say? Me and mine. Me and mine. Okay? Got it? The idea of me and mine. Wu liang zhong. No limit kinds. No measure kinds. In kinds beyond measuring. In other words, me and mine in infinite variety. What does that mean? Everybody has a different collection of things that we identify as me. Start with your driver's license. Start with, before that, your birth certificate, if you had one. Start with your passport. Then you go to what? Your email address nowadays, okay? Your cell phone. And some people don't have cell phones. Your shoes. Your face in the mirror. Those are all me and mine. Then you have the obvious things, clothes, houses, vehicles, degrees, accomplishments. What else? Fears. Everybody has a different set. Relationships, different set, different grandma, different kids, right? Things you like, your playlist. Remember when it was, what's on your iPod back years? You, some of you are probably too young to remember when that was new. They so remember Steve Jobs. What was on Steve Jobs' iPod? Mostly, you know what he had? I was reading this the other day. Steve Jobs had a complete set of Bob Dylan. None. Missing. Uh, all of them. And he had his favorites. He even had the bad albums. And Bob Dylan put out some bad albums. Did you all know that Bob Dylan spent some time as a born-again Christian? He did. Some of you are saying, Who's Bob Dylan and why do we care? Right? So if you're Steve Jobs' age, which he's no longer with us, but Bob Dylan was very important for our generation, and I'm Steve Jobs' generation. And uh, Bob Dylan being a, a, a Gemini, among other things, he went through an astrology phase. Bob Dylan went through a time when he was head over heels with astrology. So Geminis tend to be curious folks, and he's tried a lot of stuff. He's now not an astrologer and not a born-again Christian, but those are part of him. So that's me and mine, right? What is it like? Limitless kinds. Everybody has a different set. If you grew up in Kuala Lumpur, you have a different set of me and mine than if you grew up in Dallas, Texas, right? If you grew up in Barcelona, you have a different set than if you grew up in Saigon, which is now Ho Chi Minh City. Different, different set. And when what gets interesting, really interesting, is when I was growing up in the, near the Great Lakes, in the Great Lakes, and <coughs> excuse me, ooh, in Middle America, uh, things changed slowly. And there were some distinctive things that were unique to to that part of the country, that part of the planet. Now, everybody on Earth has a different set in common, which is an awareness of internet connectivity. We have changed so fast in the last 15 years. So that's, you know, as you look at this, there are some things that are just happening as, as we pay attention now that didn't exist before. So, those are all wo, ji, wo, so, wo liang zhong. Me and mine in limitless varieties. You don't believe it? Dig out your baby pictures. Take a look. That was you. 
I have, I have baby pictures right back to the bassinet, back, back to the crib. I don't look like myself. And yet, guaranteed, that was my not quite six-month-old self right there. And I probably don't look much like I will when I'm 30 years older now. So. Uh, okay, limitless kinds. Next, line three, here we go. Yun, jie, chu, deng. Zhu, qu, zhao, zhuo. Ci, si, di, zhong, yi, qie, li. The, thir- the third line, the way these verses go, there's line one, line two, line three, and then line four sums it up. Line four is the, where you get the verb and then the, the subject, subject and object. Okay. Skandas, realms, places, etc. All chu, sought after, zhuo, and grabbed, grasped. So, attached, that's a good Buddhist word. Skandas, realms, places, and stuff like that, he grabs them all. We, we grab them all. We attach to all of them. Attachments to all of them. Line four, this four ground amid there completely dropped. Completely left behind. Okay, what's it saying? You have to go to the line four before you get what's going on here. The last word of this stanza is the payoff. What is it? Li, that word, to leave it behind, to get rid of, to go beyond, to set aside. In Anglo Saxon English, to leave. The bodhisattva on the fourth ground leaves all this stuff. Okay? So we've had this list of lists. Says what? Says views of the body, 62 kinds. The self and stuff that attaches to the self, so me and mine, all the different kinds. Skanda's realms, places, and every kind of attachment that we can have to these, the bodhisattva leaves them all behind. Okay, we went quickly over line three. What is that? This is, if, you're at, if you ever were interested in psychology, this will, this will catch you. Why? These are the Buddha's description of where people come from. More precisely, what, what people are made of. This is the Buddha's personality inventory. I... Um, when I was a freshman in undergraduate school, this little liberal arts college in Michigan, I took a psychology class. And I, was, I had had some encounter with Buddhism, but very little at that point. I'd read a sutra, and I'd read uh, the Dharma Bums, Jack Kerouac, and I had uh, encountered the Six Patriarch Sutra and knew something about Taoism. But I had no knowledge of Buddhism at all, especially not proper dharma, that is to say, looking at, looking at yourself, looking in, looking inwards. For me, Buddhism was Zen, meditation, and all the outer stuff that connected to Zen. So psychology was as close as I got to what I've now come to recognize as Buddhism. I was really excited. Oh, I wanted that class. I thought, I'm probably going to you know, major in psychology. Why? What other discipline in the liberal arts education teaches you about people as they live? Right? Anthropology talks about another level. Tribes, civilizations, cultures. But my mind why I'm thinking the way I think, what makes me happy, what makes me so unhappy. Where do you go to study that? Well, psychology should be it, right? Where you actually learn about people. Boy, was I disappointed. Oh, I fell hard, I have to say. I took the only course that was available 
to a freshman uh, with a, uh, a well-regarded professor, and the entire course was on cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. Why? That, that was what the professor wrote his book about. And that's what he taught, was a damn book. Cognitive dissonance. Right? And it was mostly like, what happens when you get a disagreement? When you get a contradiction? And he taught, the, he taught that course. If that course was a rock, he wrung every bit of water out of that rock. I tell you. <laughs> How much water was in the rock? Not very much to begin with. And he... <laughs> 14 weeks on cognitive dissonance, man. Slap, slap. It's like, ah. Boring. It turned me completely off. And I went to talk to him. What was his name? He was highly regarded. And he had been hired because he was a famous uh, researcher in the field. And I said, you know, if somebody really wants to get into the stuff of psychology and figure out what people are made of and what they're all about, where do you go next? What would you recommend? He said, oh, you need a lot of statistics. Uh, you need some demographic studies. Probably need uh, some surveys on, uh, you know, uh, testing, double blind, and, uh, you know, <laughs> and I'm going, people? Like, my mind? You know, he says, oh, yeah, 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 sure. Oh, you need to know about... Uh, Mm, neurosis, psychosis, paranoia, schizophrenia, uh, lots of, uh, of hang-ups, and uh, the pathology of the mind. You need to study all that. I said, what about healthy? You know, what about, like, normal? He said, if, if you're normal, you have to study psychology. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, it's, okay, you know. And I'm exaggerating. I mean, he was a very brilliant man, no doubt about it. But for a kid who was like, you know, 18 years old, trying to figure out how do I get into the study of humanity, that, that door, I didn't want to open that door. It didn't look like I was ever going to find out how the human mind actually worked when it was doing what it should do. It was always when it was ill, you know. And I could, I mean, we need psychiatrists. People are mentally ill occasionally, and you need a good doctor who can help them. That's true. Um, psychotherapists, there, we certainly need them to help us keep our, our balance. But there in that field in Michigan, in that campus, it wasn't what I was looking for. And I have to say I was disappointed, you know. And I thought, well, if I don't find it here, where do I go? So, uh, the Buddha used these things to answer the question. And if I had had a course in Buddhist psychology, I would have been a happy camper. Yun jie chu dang. What are these? This is the Buddha's description of what makes people people. Yun is, um, sometimes the word is yin, just like yin-yang. It's called skandhas in Sanskrit. Skandhas translates as collection or heap or um, accumulation or um, component. The Buddha said there are five. To become a human, you need five of these things. And when we get all five, that's how we get our humanity. They are, first one is body, the next four are mind. So the biggest, broadest breakdown is body and mind. One and four. You go deeper, body is four elements. Earth, air, fire, water. So this is the traditional Buddhist description of where a person comes from. When we're healthy, earth, air, fire, and water are in balance and harmony. What are they? Earth, solid parts. Think bones, nails, teeth, hair. When we die, it goes right back. When we're born, we get this amazing, miraculous, magical combination of the four elements. Air are the passage, passageways. Um, skin pores, nostrils, ears, 
the pupil of the eye has a tiny hole. You know, the, every cell is mostly space. The holes in the blood vessels that allow the, the blood to pass through, etc. That's the air element. Comes right from the air. When we die, it goes back. We're constantly switching it out, pouring carbon atoms out into the atmosphere and taking in ox hydrogen and, and oxygen together. So that's the two. Number three is fire, warmth, 98.6. Until you go to Australia, and it's no longer 98.6, it's 28 point, no. What is it? What is Celsius? What is it? The, the 98.6 expressed in Celsius is? Anybody know? What is it? 55, 56, 57? 36 degrees Celsius, yeah. It's a constant. Too hot, take something off. Too cold, put something on. Keep it right. Don't believe it? Get in the shower that's too hot. Ooh, not good. Get in a shower that's too cold. Ha <laughs> ha. Dance around. So there's the warmth. And when a body dies, it gets cold. You can feel the heat go. And the water. By golly, you know, mostly water. The large part of the composition is like seawater, interestingly. So earth, air, fire, and water. That's the body part. It comes. We're, we're alive. We die. It goes. It's gone. Re recycled. That's the first skanda, the first heap. The next four are fascinating for anybody who's ever wanted to figure out why things are so tough. Or if things aren't tough, why does the happiness go so soon? You know, or how do I hang on to the happiness? Or just the, how do I keep the balance between things being tough and things being easy? They are feelings, which includes sensations and emotions, second skanda. The third is thoughts themselves. The fourth is the fascinating one called samskara, which is mental conditions, mental constructions, sometimes called activities because the Chinese use the word xing for that. Mental formations. That's a standard way. It's a mouthful. Mental formations. And we'll tell you what those are in a minute. The last one is consciousness. So those are the four that make the mind. So body, earth, air, fire, and water. Mind is the next four. Feelings, which is what? Sensations. So I feel, my nails feel different than the pads of my fingers on my skin. Cool, warm. This is hard. This is soft. Those kind of feelings and sensations, right? Hunger is a sensation. What else? Emotions. Joy, sorrow, anger, fear, grief, love, desire. Xi, nu, ai, chu, ai, wu, yu. The seven ghosts, they say. Those are the emotions. And what are they? They're half thought, half sensation. For example, when you're afraid, your knees can knock. Anybody ever be so afraid your knees knocked? It really happens. Your teeth chatter. Yeah, that's true. And when you're angry, you change color. You feel your heart speed up. So half mind, but half body. That's emotions. Those are the second skanda. And where are they? It's in the body, but somewhere also in the ether. Right? But you can definitely feel your humanity when you know joy. Right? That's a skanda functioning. We get them when we're born. They go when we die. Three, thoughts. And thoughts are specifically defined by the Buddha. He said, thoughts think us. They're like waves in the water. They come, they go. They come, they go. Waves, if you go down to the, to the marina, right, or cross over and go to the bay or go out the gate, Golden Gate, and look at the ocean, those waves, they are the heartbeat of the planet. They, 
The waves come and go, come and go. Sometimes they're calm, but just wait. They're back. Those waves come and go. Thoughts in the mind are just the same. They don't stop. And they arise as we become conscious of them at what age? One and a half or something. And we, when we die, those thoughts will carry us to our grave. Very impersonal. From the Buddhist point of view, it's incorrect to identify with our thoughts. We are not our thoughts. If anything, our thoughts are us. Like we are living because move, but they're not mine. They're a function. They're a skanda, a heap. And that, that idea, just wrapping your mind around that, number one, they don't last, but number two, you, you don't get rid of them either. They're not me. They're a function. So, Master Hua would say to us, too many false thoughts. wang shang tai duola. And we'd say, sure, are there true thoughts? You know? And he would say, that's a false thought. <laughs> so Chan masters are like that, right? Slap, you know. So oh, I guess so. That was, you know, suppose I told you, are there true thoughts? You'd just be thinking anyway. That won't help you get past those thoughts. So yes, there are true thoughts, which is the first thought not attached. And then, when you meditate, you can get to a place where thoughts no longer arise. That's a state of samadhi, and that's a wonderful state, but it's not a thought. You can't think about that state. You have to actually sit until you catch the place where those thoughts rise up. So it's very subtle. Because why? You are in the laboratory of your own mind. Professor Heinz and Brenner, whoever your name was, who wrote the book called Cognitive Dissonance. I could probably look it up if I touched my browser. Anyway, he wasn't going to tell me that why, because he was not, he didn't have a clue. Well, no, that's not true. He, that's arrogant on my part. He had clues, but he didn't have the perspective. He had never gone beyond his own mind to look at the mind. So the Buddha allowed, Buddha was did that and told us how to do it if we want to. So that's only the third skanda. Man, oh man, look at that. So body, feelings, and thinking skanda. Functions. It's just the features, like your browser. What does your browser do? Can it read PDFs? Can it stream video? Those are the features of your browser. Your mind allows you to have emotions, allows you to have thoughts. And they come and they go, and they come and they go. Through meditation, you can actually get in there and affect them, transform them. Skanda number four. Now, this one is so fascinating. It's called samskara. S-A-M-S-K-A-R-A, -A -A, skanda, the samskara, skanda. Mental formations is probably the, the, uh, the handle we can use to translate. Because why? First of all, we're using it right this minute. It's alive in all of us if you're conscious and here. So we can't think around it. We can't actually see it because it's, it's working, right? Um, and yet, we borrow the Buddha's description of what that thing does. And it has multiple levels. One level of the samskara skanda is the autonomic processes of my life right this minute, my respiration, my elimination, my digestion, my dreaming, right? All the things that the deeper constructs of thought that operate without conscious control, right? Your sleep rhythms, right? That's, that's governed by the fourth skanda. That's half of it. But there's another half which is fascinating. So if you, if you start out and you think of it going in, although it's not, it's not an inner direction, there's no core where you get to it, you got it. But think of it this way. Body, move in a level. Feelings, move in or move subtle a level. Thoughts, okay? Now move another level and what do you have? You have 
deeper thought processes. Like what? Like language. Like symbols. Symbol making. What else? Your prejudices. Biases. We got them. Our opinions. So it's kind of like coagulated thoughts. Or it's deeper systems. If anybody is a coder, you think of coders as kind of like the the uh, input-output. It's the iOS. The, um, the It's another level of, of code down below. And if you think about how that opens up, what is there in my fourth skanda? Well, um, every idea that you learned as a kid. So if you think you're very attractive, that view is there in your fourth skanda. If you think you're very inferior, unattractive, if every time you look at the mirror, you, you, your stomach jumps because you don't, you don't like your face, or if you have a bad hair day, or you just feel like, gee, I'm you know, not as pretty as my sister, or you know, I'm never going to match my husband's intelligence, you know, all of these ideas that we all have, we all have a different Brenda, they're there in that fourth skanda. They can change, they can be retrained, but they're, they're deeply there. They're in our fourth skanda. All right, so far so good. Number five, fascinating, consciousness. Consciousness itself. And here's where, I mean, what I've described so far we have equivalents for in Western thinking. Body, feelings, sensations, emotions, thoughts, and then autonomic processes and deeper thought structures. But when we get to this one, Western scientific personality inventory analysis, even um, the, the best efforts of laboratory science is still struggling with consciousness. Consciousness is in many places the, the hot, not to say taboo, although there are some hard sciences that, uh, that reject consciousness outright, but there's a cutting edge level of physics right now, laboratory physics, that has had to, ever since quantum mechanics, has had to acknowledge consciousness as a very plausible explanation for some of the things that humans do. So, how interesting. Look at this. Western empirical science is tippy-toeing up to something the Buddha explained in profound, exquisite detail 2,500 years ago. Right? But he can't measure it. It's hard to measure. That's the problem. And science has its own criteria by which we know things for sure. And by bit, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been paying a lot of attention to consciousness and trying to get the conversation going, which is good. So what is consciousness? There are three levels of consciousness that are functioning in our minds right this minute, in our deeper skandhas. So this fifth skanda is the front five senses Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, each have a consciousness connected to them. So eyes have eye consciousness. What do they see? Light, shadow. They see color. They see penetration and obstruction. So I can't see through the wall. I see the wall. can't see through it, but I'm aware there's something behind the wall. Okay? So there's eye consciousness. Ears, hears, pitch, Duration, uh, relatively, oh, by the way, go back to the eye. Infrared, mm-mm. Ultraviolet, mm-mm. Can't see it. At night, mm-mm. Cats see better than we do, right? Uh, birds see apparently ultraviolet, or is it infrared? Birds can see infrared or ultraviolet. I just was aware of that this last week. So they they can see, um, they're, oh, anybody from New Zealand? No. New Zealand has a national bird, kiwis. Right? Kiwis. Kiwis are fascinating birds that have to be protected now because they're vanishing. 
They're vanishing largely because, um, sadly, uh, these uh, possums came over from Australia. And in Australia, they are, uh, they're, they have predators that, that eat them. They're controlled naturally. They didn't exist in New Zealand. And when the possums got there, they had no natural enemies. And so they, they just flourished unabated. And as a result, possums like, they'll, they'll eat almost anything. They eat tree bark, but they also will eat any kind of eggs that they find. And kiwis population just plummeted once the possums got going. There's another animal in New Zealand called stoats, S-T-O-A-T, and stoats are like little weasels, kind of like ferrets, and they love kiwi eggs. And kiwis are these amazing flightless birds. But the reason I'm telling you this is kiwis have in their, their nose, they have these long noses, they have the ability to sense the things they eat inches below the soil. They eat little insects and grubs and termites and worms. And they don't have, they can't see them. They have bad eyes. They, they're mostly nocturnal. But they can, with their noses, sense the presence of these critters below the ground. And when they, they can sense them, they stick their noses down, gobble them up. So our noses are not as good as kiwis' noses. That whole story was to tell you about how inferior your nose is. Sorry, doesn't measure up to a kiwi. Doesn't, can't, can't match a kiwi. So many, n many kiwis, meaning New Zealand residents, New Zealand natives, haven't seen the kiwi, the, the bird, because there's so few of them left. And you have to go to like a tourist place to see kiwis, and you have to go in and the, the, temper the, the lights have to be off. And then they have ultraviolet or infrared so you can see the kiwis running around. And they look really cute. They're these puffy birds that run really fast. And they just... <coughs> so kiwis are fun. But anyway, so our senses, which have a consciousness attached to them, are puny. Puny. Visible light spectrum is like a little bit of all there is. And we can only see that much. What can we hear? Dogs hear way better than we do, above and below. Uh, I learned about that because I play the tin whistle, the Irish, you know, tin whistle. It's an Irish folk instrument. And I learned that uh, I can't play it when there's a dog around. I was at a friend's house and I pulled out my tin whistle and I was playing Rocky Road to Dublin. In the merry month of June, from me home I started, left the girls a tomb and nearly broken hearted, saluted father dear, kissed me darling mother, drank a pint. No, I shouldn't. It's not a monk song. You know. But anyway, I was playing on the pipe and playing along. And this poor dog came over and put his knees on, put his paws on my knees and got his face up to my face and went, <laughs> stop, he was saying. <laughs> I was assaulting his ears with the pitch of this tin whistle. I had no idea. But he went up, he put his paws on my knees and put his face right in front of mine to say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> stop. You know, like mid-note. He's like, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So my tin whistle offends the dog. Poor, poor dog. Maybe it's just the way I played it. I don't know. But I, it had something to do with the pitch of that instrument. So our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body have a consciousness attached to them. You ask Master Hua, what does the consciousness do? It nong fun be. It discriminates. It tells the difference. Consciousness is there to tell the difference. That's what it does. It tells the difference between light and dark, high pitch, low pitch, uh, sweet, let's see, eyes, ear, nose. Nose can tell, you know, whether there's a bug in the ground. Tongue, five flavors, or absence of flavors, sweet, salty, pungent, bitter, sour, and no flavor. And the skin has its range of sensations it can touch. Okay, that's the first of three. Second, that's, there is the sixth consciousness. 
The sixth consciousness takes the input from eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and sorts it out. The sixth consciousness, which you are listening to this lecture, it's where language functions. Its job is to get the information from the first front five and send it to another consciousness called the seventh, the, the transmitting consciousness. The transmitting consciousness is kind of like a one-way valve. It takes all of the input and it sends it into the eighth consciousness. So the seventh consciousness is a function. It's when you meditate, it's a profoundly important consciousness because we say da chi, right? We strike up, we hit the seven. Da chi, usually we interpret it as we do a retreat, a seven day retreat. In fact, the literal meaning is to hit the seventh consciousness. Why? Because, now here we go, and I have to discipline myself because we could talk about the eighth consciousness to the end of the lecture and wouldn't scratch the surface. Everybody has an eighth consciousness, the alaya, A-L-Y-A, -L -L alaya. The alaya consciousness is the storehouse consciousness. And in the eighth consciousness, which is functioning in you right this minute, you, we, I store the seeds of every single activity that I've done with my body, my mouth, and my mind. Whenever we do a deed, think a thought, say a word, especially when there's an intention connected to it, we they say, this is the Buddhist jargon, we plant a seed in the eighth consciousness. What is that seed? Karma. I am carrying the results of everything I have done with me right this minute. And tonight I'm going to be planting more. Tomorrow and more and more and more. What kinds of karma? Good karma, bad karma, and indetermined, indeterminate karma. So, Everything that I do creates a equal and opposite reaction. We've heard that, right? Buddhism agrees with, you know, Newtonian mechanics, Newton's physics. But more specifically, everything I do is planted in what's called the mind ground, the shindi. Our minds are like a garden, and everything we do grows there. To catch the intention. Did you mean to say that nasty, hurtful thing? Well, congratulations, you planted that seed very successfully. And in my mind, if I said that nasty, hurtful thing, hoping that they would be, you know, silenced or shut up and they'd be impressed with how intelligent I am or how stupid they are because I said that thing and wanting to hurt them, then that will plant and grow. And in the future, guess what? The conditions are there for me to hear something very cutting and sarcastic and mean about my intelligence. Why? I planted it. As you plant, so do you harvest. As you sow, so shall you reap, says the Bible, says the Hebrew Scriptures. So there you go. It's like, whoa, okay, that's interesting. In other words, my consciousness, that fifth skanda, right? Same old skanda, we're still with the skandas, is the bookkeeper. It's the accountant. It's the judge, the jury, and the correctional system. It's the jail or the, the heaven if you planted good karma. Every deed that we do creates our future. So what kind of a future do you want to live in? What kind of a garden did you plant today or tend today? So how interesting, man, in this description of humanity, our psychology, psychological inventory, look at what the Buddha described. This is the class I wanted as an undergraduate, right? I wanted to know about how people work, and this is what the Buddha described. He said, don't, don't take it from me. No, I didn't make it up. This is not Buddhism circle R, registered trademark. This is how we are. I'm telling you the truth. 
I'm just reflecting. I'm looking through the mirror at what I see. You know, in my own body and mind. And he said, when we die, the skandhas, which are simply functions, they're just like a set of clothes. They go away. And when we're back, we get a new set. Right away. It develops in the womb and out it comes. And horses have horses skanda. You can think, you know, the body's different, but the feelings, the thoughts, the autonomic processes and the consciousness is there complete. I, growing up in Ohio the way I did, I never related to horses. My friend Randy Snow uh, was an equestrian. He, he did jumping and so he kind of, although he and I grew up in the same super middle class, I mean totally middle class background, Randy got into jumping at some point. He jumped horses. So he spent time in stables and, you know, curry combing and I never understood horses, never, but I always wanted to. I read about them and never understood them. In Australia, where I've been living, there's a horse next door. He's a one-eyed, aged stallion. And what a character. My God, this horse has got personality back and forth. He's cranky. And if, if I am showing up with an apple, He'll come over for the apple, but he wants me to know that it's not for me, it's the apple. He's, he's like, you know, oh, I'll be nice to you, give me the apple. You, know? <laughs> you got a carrot? No carrot? <laughs> you know? And the, uh, who else? Chin uh, Fam, you know? Fam, our friend. She, uh, she would occasionally drop by and see the horse, and she said he would check her out up and down looking for the apple. And if she didn't have the apple, he would stare, turn his back, and walk away. <laughs> and, you just, and then one day, one day, uh, and if he's, if he's eating or something over there, and I'm here with, hey, apple, you know, he'll look at me, look at his food, look at me, look at his food, turn his back, keep eating, you know. It's like he has to want the apple before he'll give me the time of day. And he... Um, one day it was really different. I came at midday, and he, or I guess it was actually morning, and he hadn't, he wasn't eating. And I showed up with the apple, and he came galloping up, you know, and skidded to a stop, and gently reached out to chew the apple. And after he, I pointed out that he dropped a couple pieces, and he <laughs> sniffed down, looked for the, because he only has one eye, and he has, identifies it by smell, you know, smells for it. And then after he ate it, he like picked up his heels and galloped away with his tail waving. And it was like showing me something, you know, character. Like very interesting horse, you know. And you can see that these, this is a refined being with a, he's definitely, the third skanda is working, you know. He's thinking thoughts and wants me to understand things. He's communicating with me, you know. And he want, he's shaping my behavior, right? This horse is shaping my behavior. If I, if I want to give him the apple, I better behave, you know. And he'll take it, you know. It's like, wow, how interesting. And you could be friends with a horse like that. Personality abundant. Do you ever go mess with a horse? No? No. He was an amazing horse. And uh, one eye. Somehow, he, uh, he had a raincoat. Uh, and I think it's less a raincoat, more like a mosquito coat. Because, or a, a fly coat, because... Horse flies are nasty. And if you watch him stand still in the barnyard, he's got all the time rubbing because the flies are biting all the time. And he's got this big, long body that he can't get to. You know? So they put, when it rains, they put this coat on. And it's got eye holes. It's got his name, Bobby or Johnny. Johnny. And uh, he really likes his raincoat. He's proud of it. You can see he shows it off. You know, and I think it keeps the most of his body free of flies, unless when you put it on, there's a fly inside it. So they, you know. So anyway, character, skandhas at work. This horse is like Mr. Personality, you know. And you think, hmm, it's got a horse body, but the feelings, thoughts, activities, and consciousness functioning a mile a minute, working completely. 
And so now what are we thinking about doing? Eating more horse meat. You reading? Reading about Europe? Mm. In England, no. They don't eat horses. So when they discovered that they, in fact, <coughs> had been eating horses, not on the label, oh, the Brits were so upset. Like, no way. But in France, well, you know, it is a good horse, not a great horse, but it is a good horse. Uh, I like mine well done. You know. So, skandhas, there they are. So, five front skandhas, the sixth, the, the, script, the front office, the transmitting skanda, the, the transmitting consciousness, and then the alaya. There's the Buddha's personality in Mathura. Holy mackerel, right? Very satisfying to look at that and think, I can't grasp all that, but you know what? That makes sense to me. And when I think about it, if I'm sitting there really working and, you know, quieting my mind, it's like I get hints that that, that makes sense. I can't see all of it because I can't get outside of it, but I have a feeling that if I were quiet enough, I could. And I'm very aware of the earth, air, fire, and water and how when I'm sick, they're out of balance. When I'm healthy, they're in balance. The feelings and sensations, I see them. The thoughts rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling, coming, going, waves. and I totally see that. The, um, the, the mental formations, I can see my attitudes. I've changed a few of them. And yet, I don't get around my dreaming. I don't get around my breathing. And yet the Buddha said, if you meditate, when you enter the first dhyana, your breath stops. When you enter the second dhyana, your heart stops. When you enter the third dhyana, your coarse thoughts stop. When you enter the fourth dhyana, all mental activities stop. So you can, in fact, as you sit, get a circle around these. You can quantify these things that we came with and live in. So what a motive to meditate, right? Wouldn't it be wonderful to meditate to the place where you could see these functions and understand that they are simply constructed, that they have a limit, and there's an entire realm beyond those. That sages, men and women, from the Buddhist time on, have successfully gone around. Okay, I want to point out something here. This is not magic. This is not psychic. This has nothing to do with esoteric or meow. Right? This is not the, the possession of any magical person who has like extra special te yi gong nam. This is... In fact, the smarter you are, often the harder it is to approach this, right? This is nitty-gritty, sandals on the pavement, basic humanity. Why don't we know it? Because we love secrets. We love the magical, the mysterious, the far away. We, we're fascinated by people who say they're different and special and we should follow them and then we can get magic ourselves. Like, Quiet, sit still. Know where to look. Right? And then these, quote, magic abilities open up. But nobody lacks them. There is not a single person who is living now, who has ever lived, or who will live, who doesn't arrive with a set of skandhas intact, waiting to be unpacked. How interesting, right? It's like, this should be psychology ABC. These are the basics. This is what we come with, and yet we go pursuing things like macroeconomics. You know, We go pursuing things like weapons research. We destroy the skandhas, but we won't investigate the skandhas. Man, oh man, what's a landmine? A landmine is this device entirely designed to blow the lower half of human bodies off, to maim. Landmines usually don't kill, they maim. Right? So you can live the rest of your life unable to work. 
feed yourself, make babies, you know. That's, and we pay for that. Your tax dollars builds landmines because America makes them. And yet, does your tax dollar fund the understanding of the human? Doesn't. Right? How strange, right? How strange we are. Anyway, so that's personality inventory 101 for us beginners. What else? That's one word. Yun, right? Chie. Chie is talking about the ten Dharma realms where humans exist. It's talking about the 18 realms. The six senses, the six sense objects, the six sense consciousnesses, 18 realms. Another way of looking, another kind of slice and dice way of looking at humanity. And the chu are the senses and their objects. Dung and other. Other ways of looking at what peop, who people are. Zhu qu zhao. Grasping at these. Thinking, what? My body's really pretty. My body's really ugly. I wish I looked as pretty as who? Who's the current favorite? For a long time, it was Jennifer Lopez, right? Then for a long time, it was Angelina Jolie. And now we have to think twice about what, what is that about, right? Who, every, at some point, it was Clara Bow, the it girl. If you were living in the 20s and 30s, Clara Bow. Anybody know Clara Bow? No? Go check her out. She, Clara Bow was a movie star in the 20s. She was the first... Talky. Clara Bow was a movie star in the silent era, and then she was called the It Girl, IT. And if you look at Clara Bow, and I think, oh my goodness, you know, she looks like my grandma, you know, when my grandma was young and pretty. But every generation has theirs. For a while, it was Britney Spears, and now I don't think anybody thinks Britney Spears is, is the It Girl, you know. There's always a new It guy. So we look at Brad Pitt. Oh, my. We look at, is Tom Cruise, anybody look at Tom? Not ever since he jumped on the couch, right? Came out as a Scientologist. Brad Pitt lost his allure. But what are we talking about? We're talking about my perception of his body skanda. As soon as we found out what was inside Tom Cruise, it was like, I don't think I'm interested in him anymore. Oop, we got to see his, different, his third skanda, what he thinks like, his fourth skanda. Scientology. So we're just looking at the skin of stuff. And the Buddha would say, those skandhas come back as functions of what we do with this set of skandhas. How are we doing? Are we serial killers? Are we saints? Do we spend how much of our 24 hours every day do we spend serving people? You know, it's a question. Instead of serving ourselves. Or along with serving ourselves. A little bit. A little bit at a time. That's really good. Cooking for other people. Helping elders get through their day. Being good friends to kids. Right? How much of the time do we spend? That's where our skandhas will come back next time. It's completely, completely up to us. And the, the jargon word we use is cultivation. How much do we, quote, cultivate during the day? Meaning, looking into it, right? Um, it doesn't take much to turn the whole trend of it around from spending 24-7 chasing things to get to spending half an hour a day listening, simply. Just listening to, to it. Sitting still. Calming. Mm, what would be radical? Silence. Imagine an hour a day of silence, if we could do it. How hard that is. A day of silence. A weekend of silence. A week of silence. That's so hard. To really do that. And yet, if we just took one of those vehicles of karma, speech, mind, thought, speech, body, thought, and said, I'm going to like chill this one so that I can use it differently, listen to it. 
radical. What do we do mostly? Habit. Habit and desire pulls us back onto the wheel, is how the Buddhists talk about it. Right? It's habits, which is grooved behavior, repeated behavior, body, mouth, and mind. And then desire, meaning what? Pulled out into what we call the world in pursuit of stuff we think we want. That's karmic skanda creation. That's the skanda factory right there. The marketplace is the skanda factory where we make our next set. What will we be next time? We're determining it tonight. Okay, why? Because we do what? Chu Yun chie chu dang. Because we attach to skanda's realm's location. The bodhisattva on the fourth ground does what? Yi chie jie li. Leaves them all behind. What does that mean? It means he's aware that they're functioning, but he is not trying to please his body. He's not hoping to fill his eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body for the last time, finally, so he won't have to do it again tomorrow. How many great, fantastic meals can you eat before you go, geez, it tastes a whole lot alike, you know? That sensation of taste when it's at the fancy restaurant lasts just as long as that sensation of taste when it's oatmeal and raisins out of the pot standing by the stove. <laughs> you know? Do you ever eat out of the pot without putting it in a bowl? <laughs> That's, nobody's looking, right? You eat it out of the pot. Yeah. Like, oh, no, I'm actually eating normally. You know, out of the pot. You know? Or what's worse, you get the foil envelope and you just pour the hot water in. So make it in a cup. So it tastes the same. But it's, there's something joyful about a really good restaurant meal. You know? You wait a year to get into the four-star restaurant. You sign up months and months, you know? And then we get to, mm. it was a great experience, but they put you in the table over by the fan, you know? <laughs> so you're freezing while you're trying to eat your fancy creation. Ah, you know? And it's... It's the same, what, tongue consciousness, nose consciousness, mind consciousness, same thing. Whether you're at home with pao mian, right, with soba, eating your ramen lunch, or whether you're at the four steps, no different, ultimately, in the end. And it's the same, same stuff. So the Bodhisattva looks at that and goes, yeah, man, now that I know that, I'm going to move forward so that I can accomplish my vows to rescue beings from suffering. Why? Knowing these names, looking at this inventory, that helps. That's very helpful. It helps you not waste so much time trying to please your six senses. What do we do mostly? Mostly we run after pleasure and run away from pain. Mostly that's our lives before we wake up. Pursuing pleasure, avoiding pain. Pleasure is always just out there ahead, a little step ahead. Get that taste, sensation. Get the upgrade. And unfortunately, right behind us is all the stuff we don't want. Number one, cancer. Right? Oh, my Lord. When that word comes, the doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you. And how do you know? Do you have a warning? Nope. This comes. The pickle finger of fate picked you out and said, you've got congratulations. You know? Oh boy, you watch uh, Rip Esselstyn. Rip is the author of Engine 2 Diet. Rip is a former Ironman triathlete, three-time champion in Hawaii, who became a firefighter. He realized he wasn't going to be a Ironman triathlete the rest of his life. He became a firefighter in Austin, Texas at the Engine 2 uh, camp, the campus UT fire station and uh, Rip says these things that will shock you if you didn't know that he says 10% of the fireman's day is involved in putting out fires 90% of the calls that firemen get because they are first responders is because of 
the American diet. Food related illness takes the fireman out of the firehouse nine out of ten calls and when you get your heart attack that's your first sign that you are sick and your last. You get no second chance for 75% of the heart attacks. Mostly it just destroys the muscle or it breaks the vein and those blood is out into your system. And occasionally you get a second chance if they get there fast enough or if they're, you know, it wasn't that kind of heart attack. But most of the heart attacks that occur are your first and only warning that you had heart disease. You gone like that. There's no, you know, warning. Quick, hurry up, get to the emergency room. Nope, it's bam and you're done. So how strange. How funny we are, you know. We run from pain. But we're pursuing pleasure. It's right around the corner. And I've got a cruise through the Alaska Passage lined up for next next winter. Next I guess you don't go to Alaska in the winter. No, it's Acapulco in the winter, right? The, uh, when the Alaska Passage opens up to spring, I got a cruise. Unfortunately, the cruise ship, everybody on board got botulism poisoning. You know, so and they shut that one down. But we got one line for, uh, for the Caribbean. Boy, I was just there in the Bahamas, and the cruise ship doors open up, and down come the families. They're big folks. Oh boy, we had this uh, Scott, this Ayurvedic doctor who was there from Scotland. She's very interesting. And she's, she's not used to Americans that much. And she was on staff at the ashram. So she had, took her day off and she went into Nassau. And she came back and she said, Oh, she said, ah. she says, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. The Americans getting off the ship. They were very large people. They were bigger than I'm used to, even in Europe, she said. <laughs> there they are, and coming off, you know, to buy stuff in NASA. And my goodness, we're big now. We're, you know, that's, that's, it's not that we're greedy, or it's the, the, it's the diet. It's what we've been given. And uh, to know that one out of two children in the next 10 years will have Adult onset type 2 diabetes. We're, uh, we're not doing well with our diet. We haven't got that one figured out yet. That is, we're killing ourselves with our food that we eat. Normal people with normal food. It's not that we're evil or greedy. It's just that the food that we have given ourselves is not suited for our human skandhas. So, how interesting. We still will pick a diet Pepsi because we think that that high fructose corn syrup and aspartame is going to be better for us than the other high fructose <laughs> corn syrup with sugar. Doesn't make much of a difference whether it's diet Pepsi or real Pepsi. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Especially when we drink it in 32 ounce big gulps. Did you see the ad? Uh, not an ad. The, uh, the photograph, it was floating around Facebook for a while, of the cans of soft drinks out of the cooler with a plastic bag below and the amount of sugar per can in each plastic bag. Started out with water, plastic bag, no sugar, right? And then iced tea had like four teaspoons of sugar in a plastic baggie underneath the can, and then they went up all the way to the 32-ounce Big Gulp. The 32-ounce Big Gulp had a bag of sugar that was, you know, bulging baggy in that cup of drink. And my goodness, when you see it that way, when you see the amount of sugar that you're putting down, you go, I don't think that's good for me. I think that's probably not good for me. So, on the fourth ground, the Bodhisattva says, pursuing pleasure, running from pain at a certain point gets old. And you ask yourself, what else is there besides running for the next tasty treat and avoiding, we hope, the bad news? 
that I'm getting old and my body's wearing out. And there is a point where we go, and there's got to be a third choice between pursuing pleasure, running from pain. What would that be? What would that third choice be? And the answer would be finding out what the Buddha said. What did the Buddha say about this situation? And what the Buddha said was, birth and death can end. Old age, sickness, and death can end. And that's what I'm determined to find out. But he said, Shi Fu Lin Jin Man Xu Xing Zai Guren. The teacher brings you to the door. Whether or not you enter it is completely up to you. It is not in gurus. Whether or not you find that third choice has nothing to do with so and so's psychic powers or their compassionate method to save you. Not. Ultimately, your body, feelings, thoughts, mental formations, and consciousness are yours to operate. It's a machine. The skandhas are just like a machine. Where did you drive your five skandhas today? That's how far you got. Right? Nothing to do with anybody else's ability to read your thoughts. Can't help you. Even if they are a bodhisattva in, in reality, they won't tell you if they are, right? Right? That's really key. Right? Zhen ren bu lo xiang, lo xiang fei zhen ren, ni dong bu dong. Uh. Anybody who tells you they're a bodhisattva, walk the other way quickly. Let them be a bodhisattva all by themselves. Thank you. Good luck. So, anyhow, on the fourth ground, the Bodhisattva says, yeah, I see all this. Now I want to learn how to operate those things. How do they work? Because, man, suffering or suffering's end waits for us to figure out how to operate this body and mind that we, were, we came with. The body and mind we earned, right, that we created for ourselves. Okay, well, we only did one skanda, skan, stanza so far. That's not very much. I went too long. And skandhas are fascinating. And this is why I really was interested in psychology. And Professor so-and-so burned me out. I, maybe I should have been more patient. But, you know, 18 years old, college freshman, come on. That was my encounter with psychology, and it was a turnoff. There was nothing there. And he was in pushing me towards statistics and demographics. So I could do better s studies, you know. <laughs> like, mm, when do you get to the people? You know, well, mm -hmm. They're sick. You got to learn all about psychosis and neurosis. Mm. So here we go. Rula so he fan nao heng yi wu yi li jie chu duan, zhi zhe xiu xing qing jing ye wei du zheng sheng wu bu zuo. Afflicted types of behavior reproved by the Tathagata as non-beneficial, he completely cuts off. What the wise one cultivates, his purified karma, to save living beings, he does them all. So here's the Bodhisattva who says, yes, I understand that people are suffering bad and I've seen through, I've gotten bored with trying to please my own skandhas. I want to find a way to help other people because I believe that's the path to Buddhahood. And what do I see us doing mostly? Getting upset a lot. We mostly are unhappy. Most of us feel like we're kind of lost a lot. And the Buddha said, don't do that stuff. Killing, stealing, lusting, lying, drugging yourself, not a good idea because why? It'll slow you down. It'll even take you off the path. Those are what behaviors that the, the Tathagata reproves, means warned against. To reprove means to warn about. The Buddha says, no help, non-beneficial, won't help you. He completely cuts off. Um, further, what the wise one, the Buddha, cultivates, his purified karma to save beings, he does all of that. So this verse is just saying, the bad stuff, don't do it. The good stuff, do it. 
That's what it boils down to. So, rulai so he, to target that which warns about, fan nao heng, afflicting behaviors, yi wu yi li, and things that bring no profit or benefit, jie chu duan, he cuts them all off. How nice, he hears about it once, that's not a good thing to do, he says, I won't do it, and he doesn't. Zhi zhe xiu xing qing jing ye, the wise person cultivating purified karma, wei du zhong sheng wu bu zuo, in order to help beings across, wu bu zuo, he does every one of them. So the, the upside down stuff doesn't do, the really good stuff, he does it, she does it. Easy to say, hard to do. Boy, oh boy. Because why? Again, habits, peer pressure, custom, what's expected of us in our roles, right? We do it. Peer pressure is so strong, so powerful. Okay. There we go. Next week, we absolutely need to <laughs> get more than two stanzas done here. Um, we are in the section of lists, and these lists are fascinating because they represent the distillation. This is the, um, the essence of what the Buddha learned through all of his cultivation. And uh, he passes them on in these lists. Alice, go ahead, please. So, mm -hmm. go ahead. Okay, I see what you're, I see what you're working for. <coughs> Excuse me. These are just a description. It's, there's no, um, if I understood your question, and correct me if I didn't, the Buddha, by giving us this, is saying this is, uh, it's almost a medical diagnosis in saying there's the heart, there's the lungs, there's the liver, there's the kidneys, there's the spleen. That's pretty much all he's saying. He's saying, what is a person? A person is body and mind. What is the body? Sudha, right? Four elements. What is the mind? the other four. So feelings, thoughts, activities, consciousness. So he's just, it's very cold. He's just kind of like a doctor saying, look, you'll notice these lungs are breathing. The heart is beating. It's like that. So, so after I said that, ask your question again. Okay. Xing. And she, yeah, right. Mm. Okay. 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 Alice is asking, she says that. Um, there is one of the doors, one of the big doors that came, that opened up around the Chinese version of Buddhism, talked about consciousness. Actually, it came, the seeds of it came from India, and you can find Indian shastras on consciousness, but the Chinese really developed it. Wei Shi Lun, consciousness only. There's a uh, it existed in India, but the Chinese like really brought this. It's a whole school. And once you get started into this, 
if you are somebody who likes to research what you know smart people have said this is a really satisfying school to get into consciousness only vijnana vadan is called in sanskrit and if so her question is did the did consciousness make the skandhas and if so how do you cultivate consciousness so the answer is do exactly what you're doing already in your cultivation which is to say maybe you're a meditator maybe you're bowing maybe you're reciting the great compassion mantra maybe you're practicing giving you're a a generous person maybe you're pra- you're a karma yogi you're practicing good karma you know service you're always helping people maybe you're purifying your precepts etc etc whatever method you're practicing con- you can't do it outside of consciousness because why consciousness is what lets you hear my voice right now it lets you breathe consciousness is too big to cultivate without the other things you can't isolate consciousness out to cultivate it any more than a fish can escape the water in order to swim okay consciousness there's no separate let's say there's no thinking outside a language can you think without a symbol system in order to you know subject object verb etc you can't talk without language right you can't cultivate without consciousness so the answer i guess the answer is no you can't there's no way to directly go in and cultivate consciousness apart from everything you're already doing so the answer would be don't worry about it you're already doing it if you're cultivating right to to say i'm now going to cultivate pure consciousness no i don't think that's there's that's an interesting question but i don't think there's any way to approach consciousness separately is that was that your question no i don't think so. just go ahead and do what you're doing consciousness is included right and now <coughs> they say the the formless realm the wu su jie of of gods right so there's the the desire realm where we are now there's the form realm which is the gods at a certain level there's the formless realm which is another level of gods they say that gods in the formless realm have a very purified consciousness they don't have any bodies there's no body left because they've cultivated it away it's purified there is consciousness left and it still undergoes shengsi it hasn't gone beyond shengsi it's still in birth and death it's still mortal and it will die at some point but it's not the death of the body but it's it still comes into being it lives it goes bad and it goes away so at that level i suppose you could say consciousness is more available because there's nothing else but it's still you don't cultivate consciousness you cultivate inside of consciousness otherwise it would be like trying to talk without language maybe you'd flash lights or something but you know still trying to swim without water trying to breathe without air you can't okay yeah it's a good question though and ask Doug what he has his answer is or ask Ron Ron Epstein what his answer is That's Alice that's one of those questions that a chan master would probably slap you up the side of the head by answering, you know, or they would shout at you. Meaning what? Meaning don't ask about it, go do it. Right? Meaning just sit. If you sit and you enter samadhi, you're you're refining your consciousness. But to say you get outside it at some point? No. What does the Buddha do? 
the Buddha transforms consciousness to wisdom. Right? So what is wisdom? It's consciousness you're using right now, flipped over. Um, what is discriminating consciousness? Fun What does that do? It knows things by chopping it into smaller bits. Fun bia, fun bia, fun bia, fun. For example, um, here's an example. Science knows things by what's called reductionism. The idea is if you can take these carnations and take them down to hydrocarbons, take the hydrocarbons down to atoms, take the atoms down to elements, take the elements down to, you know, down to the smallest. The theory is if you know the smallest, you can know the biggest. That's called reductionism, right? It's the fun bia shin perfectly, right? Wisdom takes those pieces and puts them back together so that you get a principle. So you're going from the, the mo xiao down to the gum ban. The root, you see, yi ban san wei wu liang shu, wan shu rang wei yi ban. The branch tips, countless branch tips come back to a single root. The root expands into a thousand branch tips. So if you can get that branch tip to the root, then wisdom is working for you. Science discriminates, cuts in a million pieces. Wisdom integrates and brings it back to a principle. But you need them both. It's like a heartbeat. So let us transfer the merit and move on into our next round of skandhas, planting the seeds for our future rebirth with every thought. Isn't that terrifying? Makes you want to just kind of like curl up. Bodhisattvas don't do that. Nah, let me plant good seeds. So make a wish and send out your merit and virtue to all living beings as you would care to do so, whatever wish you want to make with those. I'm sure it will be appreciated as we connect with our wholesome affinities. as one and radiant with light share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness luminous and bright if people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity May their minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light break the dark of their endless night because our hearts are one this world of pain turns into paradise may all become compassionate and wise may all become compassionate and why do you all have the uh, um, craving is the builder in that Jason what's the the page number I think it's right at the start what page 10 page 10 okay so page 10 and uh, here's, this is 
this is kind of an answer to Alice's question in a way, um, is that craving, in other words, desire, once it goes out and we pursue it, it builds everything behind it. It builds a house, meaning our bodies and our lives. All of the, the skandhas and consciousness um, follows from a thought of craving. And what the Buddha did as he finally six years and then 49 days of, of hard work, um, he saw his thought of desire moving out and he did not follow it. And everything fell apart. O house builder, craving is the builder of this house. Through many a rebirth in samsara wandering, I sought but did not find the builder of this house. How painful, how sorrowful to be born again and again. Unaware that the thought of desire is building this. O house builder, I see you at last. You will build no house anymore. Your ridgepole shatters. Your rafters all fall down. My mind realizes the unborn. And craving comes to an end. So once you see that the whole thing is held together by wo, wo soyo, me and mine, all those things, and the skandhas themselves are just functions. Once the desire that gives it a me and mine falls away, there's nothing for it to build on. Craving comes to an end. And the house of my body and mind are gone. Craving is the builder of this house. This is not on anybody's hit favorite hit list, but sing along if you want to. Craving is the builder of this house. Through many a rebirth, in some sorrow wandering. I sought but did not find the builder of this house. How painful, how sorrowful to be born again and again. Craving is the builder of this house. Craving is the builder of this house. Oh, house builder, I see you at last. You will build no house anymore. No rich pole shatters, your rafters all fall down, my mind realizes the unborn, and craving comes, craving comes, craving comes. To an end. Craving is the builder of this house. Craving is the builder of this Take it from the Buddha. Now, I found something today that is currently going viral on YouTube and uh, on Facebook as well. And it's great. This is great. This is really worth showing. We're going to jump up and turn the projector on so everybody can see this. Jason, 
would you mind hitting the two switches, this one and that one? Or let's see, I was looking at two, there you got two Jasons there. All right, pick your Jason. And we need sound for this guy too. There, we need to bring the screen down. There was a day when we couldn't have done this. We didn't have the screen or the projector up. But now we can. What is that about? What does that do? Is, let's see, what's it called? Is it VC? No. Hold on here. Inspiration. No, I don't see it. Uh, one moment, just a moment. Maybe if you download it, I can hear. Media Pro. Mm, nope, I don't see it. Okay, here we go. This young man, he is from Brazil. His name is Luis Antonio, does not want to eat octopus, gnocchi, and he explains to his mother why he doesn't. We'll see here. Okay, we'll close it and open it again. This is really wonderful. Okay. Check, the, check the subtitles. Eat your octopus. This is not the octopus. No. 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 <laughs> what? O monstro cortou assim. Man cortou. O quê? Pra gente poder comer, porque senão a gente ia ter que engolir inteiro. Mas por quê? É pra comer, amor. Igual corta o boi, corta a galinha. Just like the cow and the chickens are chopped. Ninguém come chicken. Ninguém come a galinha? É, eu já nem mais. Nobody eats chicken. Those are animals said this innocent child. Eh? Eh? Hmm. Mas vamos comer true. o nhoque? Come a batata, então. Só batata e só arroz. Just the potato, tá. thank you. Nem bolfo, é os animais. Tá bom. Todos esses são os animais. Pensei os animais. 
Com os animais, caiu os animais, para os animais, pouco é os animais. Então, quanto tem de comer os animais? When we eat animals, they die. Eles morrem. Por quê? Para a gente poder comer, meu amor. Por que eles morrem? Não gosto que eles morrem. I don't like it that they die. Eu gosto que eles ficam em pé. I like it that they stay standing up. Então tá bom. Então a gente não vai comer mais não, tá bom? Tá. So. His mother is going through some profound changes. Esses animais são que tem que cuidar deles, não comer. <laughs> tá certo. You're right. So eat the potato. Então come a parte da batata e do arroz. Tá bom. Por que você tá chorando? Não tô chorando não. Eu tô emocionada com você. I'm just touched by you. Eu tô fez uma coisa ainda. <risos> então come. Não precisa comer o povo não, tá? Não need to eat the octopus. <risos> That's it. Isn't that wonderful? He thinks it all the way through and says, I want to keep animals standing up. And his mom cries because his she can't answer him. Eat the potatoes and rice. That's fine. That's Luis Antonio. That's what I wanted to show you. That's all. How oh, nice. Yeah, if you go out onto YouTube and look for Luis Antonio, uh, here, we'll find it for you. Show you. Yeah, this is one you want to... I haven't posted... I'm going to post this on my blog. So where is YouTube here? If you go to KFC is very unhappy about that. They should be. Ah. <sighs> We are experiencing. It's cranking away, folks. Anyway, um, if you go to Here we are. Luis, L-U-I-Z, Antonio, why he doesn't want to eat octopus. That's what it's called. So if you type that into YouTube, you'll find it. Why he doesn't want to eat octopus. Yeah. Okay. I was, since we're up here, you remember the wallaby? I just found the wallaby recently. We're going to find the other wallaby video. Where is it? This is the one. Um, wallabies have been in that part of the world for a very, very, very long time. Millions of years. And I'm there now um, watching them brand new. I am just, you know, the, the new neighbor. If anything, the wallabies should be, you know, uh, pa patient with us because I know so little in Australia. 
and he knows so much, or she. And by the way, there's a Joey inside the pouch right there. So we're going to put the screen there. We go. All right, ready? Here we go. Something alerts her. She says, oh, I think it's time to move. Time to go. Bye-bye. And now what is fascinating about that is the locomotion involved. Look at the size of those leaps. And how she does it is she leans forward until gravity carries her to the place where the only way to catch her fall is to get her feet there. Bounce, 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 bounce. Look at, look at how far forward she's leaning. Her center of gravity is like way out ahead and she's carrying her baby in her tummy. Touches down, leaps, leans forward, propelling herself out of sight. Notice that was like a second, two seconds from, we can actually clock it right here, from the time, boing, 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 from the time she decides it's time to go, it's now 14 seconds. The first jump is at 15. Bonk, 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 out of sight in three seconds. 18 seconds. Isn't that amazing? You ever see a wallaby travel before? Here you go. Boing, boing. And there she is, complete with child. Hello. Oh, oh, time to go. Somebody's coming. There you go. Now, if you had not come to this lecture tonight, you never would have seen that. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Benefits of the monastery. So, um, this week we have a little less to announce than last week. Last week was really busy with uh, something happening every, every night from Teons to Roundtable to the two new classes. Um, this week there's the 10,000 Buddha's Repentance ends on Tuesday. So tomorrow, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the last opportunity. Should you want to go up and take part in that remarkable event. Um, they're on schedule. I have to wait so I can he hear the projector. There we go. Um, so it's, uh, there's just the last little bit left. And uh, <coughs> then uh, this week, Dajing Fasher on Wednesday night has his beginning class. Friday night, the intermediate class. And you want to say a word about what you plan to do on Sunday? Yeah, well, this time, we're going to model next Sunday for people that like the uh, outdoors. We're going to meet uh, here at the monastery at 6 o'clock in the morning. We're going to go to the fitness park to practice. Also walking, also some uh, meditation, enjoying. And we'll be back uh, here. Free at any price. 
So that's tomorrow, next Sunday. Not tomorrow, but Sunday. Coming up. Tomorrow is rocking meditation. This is the, the end of our busy week that is tomorrow. So starting at 7.30, there will be walking meditation here at the monastery for people who would like to practice in that way. It's a wonderful way to practice. So otherwise, announcements. Buddha Root Farm, Oregon, retreat. If you have not gone, do yourself a favor and sign up online. If you don't know how to do that, come and talk to us. It's going to be a week in the Oregon woods followed by a week of Guanyin Bodhisattva recitation at CTTB. Usually it's the other way around, but this year it's the retreat first, then Guanyin. Okay, all the information is at oregon.berkeleymonastery.org. So next Sunday for the Tilden Park walking meditation, um, bring a, some, what was that, David? No octopus. No octopus. Leave the octopus behind. And no, no, how do you say it right? Gnocchi. It's not Italian. Gnocchi. You heard it. So water and a, and a yoga mat or a blanket. Okay, should we bow to the Buddhas and we'll see you next week for more of the fourth ground verses. Respect to the Venerable Master. Why, why, why?